Hi, my name is Poohhead189, and today's topic is going to be the second video in my series on the Scandinavians of the Viking Age. This video is on the Norse myths, and in particular, their influence on the society of Scandinavia. Now, I will be talking about the Norse deities and the various myths they are portrayed in, however, I will not go through each and every god and list every epic. One of the reasons is that I simply am not equipped to speak on every single Norse god or myth in a way that would be informative or unbiased in some fashion. I have studied many hours over the subject, and I am fairly informed on certain gods, particularly the ones that have shaped the Viking Age. I do own a copy of the Prose Edda by a brilliant author and an award-winning poet, Kevin Crossley Holland. Many people tend to read the Neil Gaiman or Gaiman version of the tale simply for Neil Gaiman's reputation as a good author, and while I don't intend to disprove or challenge that, I highly recommend the one I am reading, called The Norse Myths, again by Kevin Crossley Holland because it has a very large and informative notes section, as well as a glossary of similar quality, and a brilliant foreword. I've also studied these myths with other sources. The Teaching Company, as well as other YouTubers, have very good videos on the subject, and if you would like readings of the myths or videos looking into each individual god, there are plenty of videos out there for that purpose. What I'm going to do is to lay the groundwork of the Norse mythology, speaking about the gods that defined the Viking Age running from the 9th to the 11th centuries, and in particular in what ways they defined the society. I will try to give basic definitions for everything, however I also recommend you watch my previous video on the basics of the Viking Age so you're not somewhat lost. Anyway, let's get started. The gods of the Viking Age are far older than you might first think. They are deities of an older Germanic tradition stretching back thousands of years, to at least the early Roman period, and perhaps even before. We do know of Roman chroniclers speaking of the early versions of the Norse gods, and the Germanic tribes began using the runic script they're known for around the year 200 BC, as far as we can tell. Now to expand upon that real quick, the Scandinavians of the Viking Age were what I call a semi-literate culture, which is quite unique among Europeans of the time. You'll find in continental Europe that the higher members of society and the clergy were literate, and many of the lower classes were illiterate if they didn't need to be. But you might still consider it to be a literate or illiterate culture, one or the other. And so why would I call Viking Scandinavia to be semi-literate? Well, every Scandinavian knew the runic alphabet. The reason they're semi-literate is because they didn't use the alphabet like we would to write messages and relay information or to write down something to make sure the messages last through the ages like a chronicler. Instead, runes were used to communicate with the gods. Runes were put on swords to see if the god they worshipped would bless it with magical properties, or runes were placed on graves so the gods might help guide their souls to the afterlife. Runes were never used for actual writing or manuscripts. You're more likely to find runes on stones and steel than paper. I'll get back to runes later, but it's important you understand that. So. One thing you need to understand is that while the Scandinavians had no priestly class or clergy, and they never built huge shrines to their gods, they only built minor ones every now and then, they probably treated their religion far more seriously than most Christians today treat Christianity or Christ. Their myths and legends were very telling in how Scandinavians viewed the world. Their lives were harsh and sometimes brutally cut short, and they could never perceive a world or mythos where something or someone even the gods in the afterlife last forever. They couldn't wrap their minds around a plane of existence that was ever enduring. To them, even gods die eventually, as does everything, which gives a reasonable explanation for things like Ragnarok. The Scandinavians were a very fatalistic people, which I don't know about you, but it fascinates me. It was also one of the reasons why they sought to perform great deeds to be sung of, because you will die, so will your children, their children, and eventually the gods. The only thing... The only things of you that will endure will be the stories they tell of your exploits. They were also avid believers in destiny and fate. Why be afraid when your fate would find you one way or the other? I believe this philosophy is best summed up by Skirnir, who is the god Freyr's messenger and vassal, in the poem Skirnir's Journey. And I quote, Fearlessness is better than a faint heart for any man who pokes his nose out of the door. The length of my life and the day of my death were fated long ago. Before we continue, allow me to give a brief overview of the Scandinavian cosmology. The nine realms, main realms at least, there were also a few more realms, there were minor ones, were connected via the great tree Yggdrasil. 
The fact that it's a tree is significant in and of itself. As stated in my last video, the forests of northern Europe, particularly in and around Scandinavia, were thick and natural barriers. It was far quicker to travel via sea routes, and so Yggdrasil being the connection between the Nine Realms meant that though the realms were connected, they were extremely hard to travel through. Yet at the same time, trees were seen as givers of life and the sign of the natural world, and it was only fitting that the realms were connected by something as stout and natural as a tree. And just as with the fatalistic views of the Norse, the animals of the trees, such as Ratatosk the squirrel and the dragon Nidhogg, both nourished and caused the tree to suffer greatly in an odd take of the circle of life. I'll give a quick list of the realms now. There was Asgard, realm of the Aesir, or the warrior gods, like Thor and Odin. There was Vanaheim, the realm of the fertility gods, like Freyr and his sister Freya who waged war against the Aesir until they came to an agreement and joined forces via marriage alliances. There was also Alfheim, the land of the High Elves. These three realms were at the top of Yggdrasil. The middle level had Midgard, or Middle-earth, where humans lived. You'll see a lot of things you'll recognize from Tolkien and Norse mythology. Midgard was Earth, essentially. There was also Nidavellir, the land of the dwarves. Svartalfheim, the land of the Dark Elves, though not much is known of them. And there was the land of the giants, Jotunheim. There was also Hel and Nilfheim, though some believe these two were the same place, as they were both lands of the dead. And last but not least, there is Muspelheim, the land of fire. You can clearly see some similarities to Christianity as well, can't you? Though the Scandinavians didn't see the realm of the dead like Hel or the realm of fire, uh, like Muspelheim, as inherently evil or punishments like Christians would. Their idea of punishment would be eternal ice and cold, not fire. They already lived lives of bleak winter, to take away their small summer would be even harsher. Now that we have the basic cosmology down, let's talk about the gods themselves. As stated, there were the Aesir, or warrior gods, and the Vanir, or the fertility gods. It's somewhat hard to put a category on just what the gods are. Snorri Sturluson, who wrote most of the myths we have now in the 12th century, treats the gods as warriors and heroes of old that had ascended and had experienced deification or legendary status among the men of Midgard. Many Christians saw them as old powers that are a part of the armies of hell or Satan, and or greater demons meant to guide others away from Christ. And still others knew them as the true gods of the world, and even though they were fated to fall in a climactic battle at Ragnarok, they were still to be revered. Now, all gods were worshipped in some form or fashion by various tribes and clans of the Scandinavians, but the Viking Age saw the rise and worship of a few key deities. The most important god of the Viking Age was Odin. Honestly, you could go so far as to say that he was the epitome of the Viking Age, and that it might also be accurate to call the age the Age of Odin. Odin wasn't merely an elderly god that sought wisdom. Yes, he did indeed seek wisdom and knowledge in many of the stories, but contrary to popular belief, he was first and foremost a war god. Odin was rage, in all of its aspects, as the famous scholar and chronicler of the 11th century, Adam of Bremen, put it. Odin was not a god to be loved or adored. He was a god to be feared and respected. In the tales, heroes incurred Odin's wrath at their own peril. He was the god of warriors, and the god of heroes and jarls. It was Odin that collected the fallen heroes to Valhalla in the Hall of Gimli, to await Ragnarok, and because he was a god of war and heroes, he was a god of poetry, as most of the epics were done in poems that told of great deeds and terrible warriors in battle, and it was the same passion that drove warriors into battle that drove skalds to explode into poetry. One could say he was a god of extremes, or passion, lust, rage, the god of the famed berserkers and skalds, but yet also knowledge and wisdom. That says a lot about the Viking Age, in my opinion. It's very telling that the chief god was also a god of wisdom, for though the Vikings did not have great institutions for learning, they were not stupid, not in the slightest. They knew that knowledge was an important aspect in all areas of life, but it was something to be gained through your own experiences and hard work. Every time Odin gained wisdom, he had to travel great lengths or sacrifice something in order to attain his goal. He cuts out an eye to drink from the spring of Mimir, which is a spring of wisdom at the bottom of Yggdrasil. 
He also hangs himself for nine days and nine nights, and pierces himself with a spear during the process, so he teeters between the realm of life and death so he could gaze into the well of Erd, which was the water that Yggdrasil drinks from. And the three Norse maidens who weaved fate, or the Norns, live within the well. They see Odin's sacrifice, and after nine days and nights, he managed to make out shapes in the water, which come to be the runes. And because he is the god who discovers runes, he is also one of the gods of magic. But as I said, at his very core, he is a god of war. The Scandinavians give credit to Odin for their wedge formation tactics, and all who wish to be heroes or successful in battle give due respect to the Allfather. Odin was not always the head god, however. As far as we can tell, that privilege used to be Tyr's domain, who was also a god of war. Though Odin overtakes him as the leader of the Aesir by the year 600 at the least, Tyr is still seen as the bravest and most valiant god, and a ferocious god of battle, though he had lost much of his importance by the Viking Age. You still did well to give homage to Tyr before battle. However, after Odin, the second most important god of the Viking Age was a figure that is still very popular today, Thor. The god of the largest tier of the population, the Freemen. One might even say he was the god of Earth and humanity. It's true he was mighty in battle, quick to wrath. However, he was also just as quick to appease and have a drink with. He was a representation of the common man. Freemen were both warriors and workmen, and that is speculated with why Thor famously wields a hammer. Contrary to popular belief, Mjolnir is not his only weapon. However, it is his main weapon, and that was an odd choice for a weapon during the Viking Age. Warhammers had not been, for a lack of a better term, invented yet. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that no warrior ever grabbed a long hafted hammer and brought it to battle, but hammers were only created for warfare in the late 14th century in response to the advent of plate armor, so using a hammer as a weapon was pretty much unheard of in the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. However, the hammer was seen as a tool of the working class. You could forge and build with a hammer, and Thor used it as a tool to forge order. He was the god of order and justice. It's why he's often the god to fight the Jotuns or giants, because they along with other monsters were a part of the forces of chaos. Thor wasn't stupid either. He was a simple god, but he had his moments of being clever. When you read poems and stories of Thor, almost everything about him is as a representation of life as a Scandinavian. Him battling monsters and giants is man versus nature. He can be tricked, but he always pulls through, and he wants to live up to the ideals of his father, but he's also his own person. Thor is also not a god who wants. He doesn't chase after wisdom like Odin, yet Thor inherently knows right from wrong. He knows when to fight and when to feast. And finally, his last aspect is that of the skies. Today, he's known as the god of thunder, but that's just one area of his domain. In fact, he's the god of all skies. It's why Vikings would give prayers to Thor before they took their voyages and why they wore pendants with Mjolnir on their necks, to appease him so that their sailing goes smoothly, because as you know, if the weather is calm, then the sea is going to be calm. There is also some debate as whether or not Thor was actually the chief god of some Scandinavian societies, rather than Odin. There's not too much evidence for this, but there was a shrine located in Sweden, I forgot where, in the, even as far as the 13th century, that showed Thor as the center, uh, in, as the center god in the largest statue in a shrine with Odin to his side, and I believe Freyr or Freya to his other side. But this is just one shrine, just letting you know that it is a possibility that Many people still saw Thor as the chief god, although, for the most part, it was Odin. And of course, we can't talk about Thor without speaking of the wonderful character Loki, who is a testament to the Scandinavian delight in trickery and pranks. In a way, he's a secondary representation of Odin. As Thor had Odin's skill in battle and his valor, Loki betrayed Odin's love for deceit and took it to new heights. In many Norse tales, Odin is under an assumed name or guise. In fact, he has over 200 names throughout the Germanic traditions, either him simply going by a different name to a different tribe, or an alias he uses to disguise his true nature. Loki takes that and makes it his domain. And just as all Norse deities, he is more than a simple caricature. The Norse took their word very seriously, and anything written in runes was considered sacred. Yet at the same time, jokes and pranks were still appreciated. 
and they needed a way to showcase the very breadth of how far one could go to have fun or to get their own way. Loki represents a very light-hearted, joking nature, yet also its dark and deceitful extreme. It's one reason why Loki joins the forces of evil at Ragnarok, for deceit and lies can easily lead to chaos, though they initially seem harmless. You also often see Loki being very promiscuous, sleeping with Jotun maidens or other goddesses or gods, changing form and finding pleasures where he may. That connects very much to the Scandinavian way of life in the far north. Bear with me for a moment, for I have a few points to make. It was a harsh existence up north, where the winters were long and brutally cold, and the summers were short-lived and not without its dangers as well. This is one reason why travelers in need of shelter or guests were never to be refused or mistreated, because not only would that lead to many deaths, but you never knew when a wanderer who was in need of shelter was a god in disguise. You would not want to refuse Odin or Heimdall a night to sleep. However, because of the difficulties of northern life, you always wanted to have a functional household, and you could not do that if a husband or wife was cheating on one another. Which leads back to the promiscuity. That might be a fine in warmer climates, or areas of the world where you did not have wolves and bears prowling the forests, but in Scandinavia, a family without both spouses was weakened and vulnerable. And yet it still at times happened, and lies turned to more lies, or it led to blood feuds. One thinks of Loki sleeping with someone he shouldn't have and then turning into a goat and prancing off so he'd be blameless of the act, which could easily be a parallel to a Norseman sleeping with a tavern wench and blaming it on a goat. Not only that, but blood feuds were also a commonplace in Viking society, particularly in Iceland, or at least that's where they were best documented, and they could happen for any reason, though affairs were likely a cause of it. The blood feuds of the Norse were almost a small-scale version of Ragnarok, if you look at it a certain way. A group of people tearing themselves apart due to a wronged or chaotic individual in the family that would lead to many deaths. There's so much representation of the Scandinavian way of life in its myths and deities, it's incredible. You have Heimdall, the Watcher, who could see a hundred miles in any direction with his naked eye. The one who created the very fabric of Scandinavian society by creating the three classes. The story goes that Heimdall went under an alias and, just as I said earlier, was a god that portrayed himself as a traveler and he visited three homes, and based upon the way they treated him, he then forged the three distinct levels of society. It's also good to note that Heimdall was a white guy, by the way, and I'm not even saying that to be difficult. Uh, in the myths, he was known as the White Azir, so getting a... so I'm not sure what Marvel is trying to do, if it was trying to be ironic to cast Idris Elba to play him or if they knew what they were doing but it's not only it but it's so wrong it's almost ironically correct um okay now I will give you a word on the Vanir or the fertility gods they were also prominent in Norse society yes however they didn't affect the Viking Age in any particular way compared to how they always affected the Scandinavians by that I mean they didn't affect the Viking Age in a way that was extremely unique compared to other times in Germanic history. At least from the research that I gather. However, I'll speak about one to give some flavor and perspective on the Vanir, or the other side of the gods. The head god was Freyr, but we're going to speak about his sister, Freya. Now, one thing to know about Freya is that she went by another name, Frigg. Now, if you're watching this video and you're a connoisseur of Norse myth, and you might start reeing when you heard I called them the same goddess, more than a few scholars believe that Frigg is simply a name Freya took. Another guise as some other gods do. They are also both married to Odin, or a guise of Odin, and both are gods with almost identical domains and personalities. So for now that's what we're going to go with. Freya was a goddess of fertility, as most Vanir. Fertility of crops and people. Most villages had shrines or small statues dedicated to her, though many of them worshipped her using different names. As you might have guessed, she was a goddess of sex. She was promiscuous at times, though it was seen in a positive light unlike Loki. However, she didn't do it to sate her own lust, at least solely. Sometimes it was to reward a valiant hero. Sometimes it was so she could get something she really wanted, though in those times, uh, her promiscuity was more likely a reluctant thing with reluctant sexual encounters. An example. There was a story of her walking through the mountains and hearing of four dwarves working behind a boulder within a small cavern, and they were forging the most beautiful necklace she had ever seen. That was ever made, in fact. She simply needed to have it, and just so you know, she was a god of lust, not only of the flesh but of jewelry and beauty, and she had a dark greed to her. She simply had to have the necklace, and so she went in and bargained with the dwarves. 
Yet no matter what she offered them, they refused until they told her that if she lay with each of them for one night, they would give her the necklace. She agreed reluctantly, and after fulfilling her end, they gave her the necklace. Well, Loki knew the four dwarves, and eventually found out where the prize necklace had gone and what Freya had done to get it, and he told Odin. O Odin, who was her husband. Odin then told Loki to steal it from her as she slept, and he did so. When Freya went to Odin to tell him someone took something dear to her, he showed her he had the necklace and she was furious until he revealed he knew what she did to get it. In exchange for his forgiveness and the necklace, she needed to use her charm to cause two human kingdoms to war with one another, so that many great heroes would be able to fill Valhalla from the ensuing conflict. And so she did, and she wore the necklace for the rest of her days. Now, something extremely interesting to me is the relationship between Freya and Odin. The previous story does not truly encapsulate their dealings with one another. It's an odd reflection of how Vikings and their wives interacted. Freya wasn't simply a goddess of sex or beauty or fertility, but she was also a goddess of war. She wasn't dainty or faint of heart. She was famous for her charm, but she was also the goddess of the Valkyries, and she did not shy from combat or conflict. Yet she did often stay in Asgard as Odin went off in search of wisdom or warriors, and she often lived in a, a lonely life. At times she would go out searching for him on her chariot pulled by cats, as cats were often kept around Norse households to kill vermin, and yet despite all of her searching, she would never find him and she would have to wait for him to return from his duties. For Odin traveled in many forms and guises and finding him was beyond difficult. One might think of the way Scandinavian women would wait months or years as their husbands ventured out as Vikings, seeking treasures and livelihoods. Yet, the two gods always return to one another and support each other in their endeavors, something Vikings would aspire to. Now, I'll speak a bit more about Freya in my video on Scandinavian women, and that sounds way more pornographic than it really is, but I believe my point has been made. The Norse gods and myths are very much a reflection of Scandinavian society and a way of life. Now, it's important to remember that, though they didn't bring preachers and they did not have a priestly caste, they did bring their religion to other areas in a certain fashion that the Christians, Celtic pagans, Slavs, and Muslims wouldn't forget. The most notable is human sacrifices to please Odin. And when I say human sacrifice, the image that probably comes to your head is some mystic altar with alchemical or demonic symbols and a ritual knife. It wasn't like that at all. It was usually far more simple, yet just as deadly. I've tried to research this subject before, whether or not executing people by hanging started in the Viking Age, or perhaps on the mainland and it was only a punishment or for criminal acts, and not used in mass scale warfare, but Vikings would often hang prisoners of war as sacrifices to Odin. Remember how Odin hung himself on Yggdrasil to gain knowledge of the runes. There's an account of one of the times the Vikings occupied Paris a large force of Viking warriors, an estimated force of 150 ships and what we believe to be have been 5,000 warriors made their way into the Frankish river systems. Charles the Bald, who I believe was Charlemagne's grandson, went out in force to meet the raiders, and to cover more ground he split his forces. Half of his army traveled on one side of the river, and the other half on the other side to comb the river for Vikings. I believe the river was Rhines, or Rienne. After a while, Charles the Bald and his half of the army approached the river once more, and across the water they saw what was left of their other army, all 111 prisoners dead and limply hanging by their necks along the tree line. It was as if the Vikings were ghosts, they had annihilated that half of the army so quickly. Charles the Bald never saw them, only their sacrifices to Odin, and part of his army just hung dead on the trees. Charles and his remaining forces then fled in fright, and the Vikings took Paris with little resistance. This Viking force was led by Ragnar Lothbrok, one of the more famous early Vikings. If you're a fan of the show Vikings, I haven't seen it so I cannot tell you if it's an accurate representation, but Ragnar is the name of the main character in it. There is also a far more grisly way to sacrifice to Odin as well, and there is an account of Ragnar's sons performing this act of sacrifice in revenge for their father's death. Apparently, after a successful campaign against the Franks, Ragnar decided to raid the kingdoms of England, where he was said to have lost his life. The king of Northumbria had repeatedly thrown him into a pit of snakes, where he managed to survive for a long time until one of the snakes finally sank their teeth in him and he died of poison. This was just a story, but I see no reason not to believe it other than it's a direct parallel to when Atli in the Germanic sagas, better known as Attila the Hun, 
through the Norse hero Gunnar in a snake pit as well, and he suffered a similar fate, having charmed the snakes with a song or something until he nearly survived until the last one got him as it did Ragnar. Anyway, Ragnar's sons, particularly Ivar the Boneless and Halfdan, led the great heathen army into a campaign of England that eventually led to the destruction of four out of five of the English kingdoms. But first they set their sights in Northumbria, reputedly in revenge for the capture and death of their father. And when Ivar and Halfdan got their hands on King Ella, reputedly they performed what was known as a blood eagle on him. Now, what a blood eagle is, is when you cut open someone's chest and break their ribs and pull their lungs out, and then flip them over the man's shoulders onto his back to look like a small pair of bloody wings, and this was seen as another sacrifice to Odin, though how it connects to Odin I am unsure of, though I do know it is connected. And as you can imagine, that's a very terrible way to die, and perhaps it's connected to Odin because of how much Odin epitomized rage. Okay, so now that we have some view of the gods and the cosmos, let's get to, for lack of a better term, animal totems. This has little to do with the society, but it does have something to do with the Viking warriors, and there are various clans that have animal motives. I won't go into too much detail because Viking weapons and tactics will be its own video, but you should understand that Vikings were not just disorganized barbarians without cohesion. They were a very organized group of warriors and knew how to win wars strategically and logistically. However, in the midst of battle, some of them, notable the, notably the Berserkers, would lose themselves in rage and passion of combat as the spirit of Odin fueled them, and they used different totems or animals to channel their rage. First, let's speak of the bear. There were bear berserker cults, and bears were synonymous with strength. However, bears were not often seen and featured in Norse myths, oddly enough. At least the myths that we know of that survive until today. Undoubtedly, some have been lost. But, um, I digress. The name Bjorni or Bjorn or Bjorn or even Beowulf meant both bear and strength, and these berserkers wore bear skins to battle. Also earlier when I said Bjorn and Bjorn, there was two different spellings, B-J-O-R-N and B-E-O-R-N. Just want to make sure you knew that. There were also other warriors who wore the pelts of wolves, and wolves were often seen in mythology as both good, Odin owning two wolf companions, and being seen as a malevolent entity that preyed upon men. The wolf watches the hall is a very indicative saying, which indicates Ragnarok. Fenrir custom comes to mind as one of the great evil wolves that fights at the end of days against the gods. Good or bad, the wolf always represented ferocity. Something very, very odd that I found out as well, when I looked into the boar in the Scandinavian sagas and viewpoint, the boar is seen as a creature that represents nobility, but that's not the odd thing. For you conspiracy theorists out there, you'll find this very interesting. The only real boar we know of in the Norse sagas is described in a way that very much sounds like a robot. The boar Gulenbursti was a gift made for Freyr, brother of Freya. The boar was said to be made of iron, and the bristles on its mane glowed with forge fire, like a power source or a vent of flame within it, and it was also used as a light source, a bit like headlights. It sounds suspiciously like a robot or motor vehicle, and yet that simply could not be the case as far as we can tell, but it's interesting to note. Another animal that is seen as both a sign of nobility and fertility was the stag and the elk. A stag called Ekthirnir stood at the very top of Yggdrasil upon Valhalla for a reason we do not really know of. It's said that as the stag eats the leaves of Yggdrasil, dew falls upon it and the drops from its antlers flow down and fall into Midgard, creating numerous rivers on the earth. Maybe it just goes to show that stags are very integral to the natural world. And of course, there were also ravens, which indicate prophecy and knowledge, and there's m many more animals that I can delve into, but for now I think this shall suffice. The natural world was a very, very central part of Scandinavian society. Perhaps not in the similar way that Celts thought of things, but as I just showed, it could be represented in many ways. And I believe that sums up the video. There are a few other things I could touch upon, and if they're important enough, I'll speak of them in another video. Though for now, I think this is good. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope you found it informative. 
please like or subscribe. It always helps the channel. Comments are encouraged because discussion breeds learning. All right. Thanks, guys.